Harris, and I'm a shift supervisor at the San Diego Fine Woodworkers Association member shop. I'm also the tool lead for our table saws. These are two saw stop table saws, and we're pretty proud of these. They're really central to just about every type of woodworking that you'll get involved with. We're making this video so that we can just go over the policies and procedures for proper usage and safety procedures for these saws. All the woodworkers should be aware of what the saw can do, what it's telling us, and proper ways to use. The general safety policy is applicable here for the table saws and just about every piece of equipment in the shop is that eye protection is always required. Uh, hearing protection is strongly recommended, but it's up to the individual as to whether they wear it or not. Also, you want to make sure that you don't have any loose clothing. Long sleeve shirts should be rolled up. Uh, if you have long hair, it should be tied behind your head. Uh, jewelry, loose jewelry should not be dangling while you're using the table saws or any other rotating equipment here in the shop. Also, never wear gloves when you're operating the table saws. This is where the operator stands when they're operating the table saw. This is your power activation switch. This is your blade raise and lower wheel. This is your blade tilt wheel. When you raise and lower the saw, as I explained, snug it down. Now maybe you want to tilt the blade to a certain angle, snug it down, make your cut, take off the lock, Snug it down, lower the blade. The point is you never want to take those locks and bring them all the way. They do not have to be cranked down, just snug and they'll be just fine. This is the professional cabinet saw or the number two saw. The one over there is the number one saw. It's the industrial cabinet saw. This is the power activation unit for the saw stop table saw. They're identical for both saws. If you notice, there is a green standby light right now, solid green. That's telling you that everything's ready to go and the saw is in, in standby. If you turn on the saw, it stays solid. If you turn off the saw, it starts to flash. That's the coast down for the saw. When the blade actually comes to a stop, you'll see that it finally goes back to a solid green. That's telling you that it is now in standby and it's okay to activate the saw again. The saw stop table saws are equipped with what they call flesh sensing technology, but it really senses if any skin contact comes in touch with the blade, but also any moisture content, such as use of wet wood or any metal inside of woods. So here at, the, here at the member shop, we make sure that we don't use wet wood. We have a moisture meter so it can be uh, measured, 15% uh, moisture or less. We don't use urban wood, or at least we're very careful about how we use urban wood. We also have a metal detector so we can check wood to see if there's any nails or tacks. In particular, people should pay attention to wood that they might buy from one of the big box stores like Lowe's or Home Depot because all of those pieces of wood that come from those stores come with UPC tags that are tacked on to the wood. Sometimes people pull the tag off, but they don't pull the staple off. If any of, those, if any of that metal comes in contact with the saw blade, that can trip the saw blade and resulting in damage to the blade and replacement of the Saw blade, saw blade break. This is a recent example of an activated break on a table saw blade. You can see how deep it buries the blade into that break. Every time this break gets activated, the break itself costs about $80 and the blade can cost as much as $150. Now, if the blade were to activate, because of somebody touching it, there's no cost. I mean, it's doing its job. But if the blade activates due to operator error, i.e. wet wood, metal in the wood, inappropriate clearances between a miter gauge, etc., then the operator is responsible for the cost of that replacement. Now we've had 
at least three or four activations due to wet wood. We've had several activations due to metal in the wood. It could have been a nail in the wood that wasn't spotted. We've had one activation where it was actually the uh, manufacturer's UPC code that was tacked into the end of the board and that activated it. The most recent activation was due to the operator actually checking the distance between the blade and the fence before the blade had come to a complete stop. So again, the only time you do put metal to the blade, i.e. a ruler or a tape measure, is when that blade is completely stopped and you have the solid green light and standby over here. If you have a flashing light or a standby or a contact activated light, do not put that metal to that blade. And if there's any question about whether the wood is too wet or whether it might be wet, make sure, ask the shift supervisor, we have the moisture detector right over there, we have the metal detectors right over there, they'll check it out for you. If it comes time to change a blade, whether to a different type of a blade or to a dado head, contact the shift supervisor. Shift supervisor will either supervise you while you change the blade or will do it themselves. But if you do it yourself, do not start the table saw until shift supervisor has inspected the, the setup. We have dado heads available and uh, uh, so you can do dado cuts, which are non-through cuts. Uh, but uh, especially with dado blades, you should have a shift supervisor present when you make those changes. Over here by the back door is a cabinet. Inside that cabinet is the moisture tester and the metal detector for use with checking wood before it's used on any of the saws. So Wagner Model 220 moisture detector that'll be used to check wood. And a wizard metal detector for checking for nails, tacks, staples, just about anything inside of wood. If the moisture is too high, again, 15% or greater, or there's metal detected inside the wood, you're not allowed to cut the wood with the table saw. It's important to note also that you can't use pre-treated wood when you're cutting because that moisture treatment inside the wood will have a tendency to trip the saw. And it's also important to know that wood dries from the outside in. The moisture detector only detects down to about three quarters of an inch. So if you're cutting a very thick piece of wood, you could detect 14%, 13% on the outside of the wood. You could have a wet pocket inside that wood that would trip the saw. So when we're, the thicker the wood, the more conservative we are about whether or not we're gonna use it on the table saw. There are two basic cuts that you make with the table saw. One is a rip, saw, rip cut, which is ripping along the grain of the wood. The other is a cross cut, which is ripping across the grain of the wood. Whenever you're ripping wood, you want to use the rip fence. The rip fence is positioned back and forth, depending upon how thick you want to cut. Well, when, when, if you're within three inches from the blade, you always want to use a push ball, a push stick or a push pad. So let's say we're going to make a cut. That's going to be about, what I'm going by is about two inches thick based upon the scale. I always set the blade height so that my the, the deepest gullet will just clear the top of the cut piece. When I'm making the rip cut, I'm going to use both hands. My left hand, and I am right-handed, so you would reverse this if you're left-handed versus right-handed. My left hand is on the table and it will not move throughout the cut. I'm using it with my thumb and middle finger to push the piece of wood up against the fence. My index finger is pushing down on the wood, keeping it on the table. 
as I push through, I'm not putting any pressure, no pressure downward here, because I want to keep this piece of wood on the table. So I push through, and as I come through onto the table, then I'm going to grab my push stick, and I'm going to put it right in the middle between the blade and the fence to keep that even pressure all the way through on the cut. You've got a solid green light, you're ready to go. The next thing you do is always open the blast gate. Before you start the saw. Dust collection system is on. For this demonstration, it's not right now, but make sure the dust collection system is on. And then turn on the saw. Now by definition, this is my off cut. This is the piece of wood that I was cut per measurement. I don't reach in and try and pull that off cut piece away until that blade is completely stopped. The push stick allows me to actually extend my arm by at least a foot. So it allows me to push through past the blade and exit it out into the outfeed table. When you're done with your cut, Lower the blade. Close the blast tape. And then leave the saw cleaner than when you found it. This area here between these two miter slots is what they call the kickback area. So if you notice my body position, I was not directly behind the blade. Uh, you can either be off to the left or off to the right, whichever is most comfortable for you. But you want to make sure that if there's going to be a kickback, you're not behind the blade. If it gets kicked back, it's going to go right by you. So as you can see, we have a riving knife behind the, the, the blade. The riving knife is no higher than the blade itself. And what the riving knife does is it keeps the, the wood from closing in around behind the cut because that's when a blade can grab a piece of wood. So riving knife or splitter, whichever you want to call it, is uh, you want to make sure that that is in place before you make a cut, a rip cut. Now as stated earlier, I said I use my left hand for, as a dual pressure there to hold the wood up against the, the, the rip fence and to hold the wood down with my index finger. If you don't feel comfortable with that, you can also always use a feather board. They're located over here off to the left side of the table saws. You just push the feather board up against the wood, giving it light pressure, then turn your magnets on, and it's gonna hold that piece of wood up against there. Then you can just put your hand on top of it like that and continue on with the downward pressure and the push stick when it's needed. In doing a cross cut, you're going to use either a miter gauge or a cross-cut sled. This is the miter gauge that comes with the saw itself. You never want to use the miter gauge and the rip fence together. The reason is basically you have two different planes working against each other here, perpendicular to each other. You have a plane moving this way through the blade and a plane putting pressure on this, which can cause the wood to get pinched and that could result in kickback. There is a modification to that in that, let's say you're trying to do repetitive cuts. Uh, maybe you're doing drawer sides for a cabinet or something like that, and each side has to be, say, 18 inches long, and you want to do repetitive cuts. Each one of these saws has what's called the one and a quarter, two and a three inch block. This is one and a quarter inch thickness. This is a three inch thickness. So I can turn around and sit my fence my block up against there and I'm going to add, let's say I'm going to have this be 18 inches when I'm going to add one and a quarter inches to that it'll be 19 and a quarter inches. Now this is well back from the blade so I can turn around, turn on my saw, run it through 
and then bring my next piece up and run it through again, and they're all gonna be the exact same size. We have several crosscut miter gauges available for use with these table saws. Important to remember is that you, at no time should the miter gauge be in contact with the blade. It shouldn't even be close to the blade. In this particular case, if I raise this up, you can see I'm easily the width of a thumb away from that blade. That's acceptable. It becomes very tricky when you start to do tilt cuts or uh, miter cuts where you're actually tilting the blade. You still want to make sure that you're no closer than the width of your thumb to that miter gauge. When you use a miter gauge to make a miter cut, the workpiece is the piece you're going to support. The off cut is on the other side of the blade. The reason for that is that you'll get a cleaner cut supporting the workpiece rather than the other way around. So I'm going to demonstrate this now. I'm going to pinch the workpiece up against the miter. I've already I've verified that I've got the angle that I want, and then I'm going to grab the handle here. Notice my hands are not even close to that blade. Waiting for the blade to stop, I remove the off-cut piece. The next uh, accessory we have is the cross-cut sled, which is actually probably the safest way to do any cross-cut that you would have, at least a 90-degree cross-cut. Fits right into the miter slots, comes right up, and then we can raise the blade to our desired height. Again, just so the gullets clear the wood. I set my wood in there and just like on the miter gauge, I'm gonna squeeze the wood up against the fence and I'm just gonna push it right through the cut. You can see that supports the workpiece very well and the off cut is well supported as well. Now, if you're, again, if you're gonna do repetitive cuts, you can clamp yourself a stop block over here. Could be clamped right there and maybe you're measuring 12 inches and you're gonna do repetitive cuts. Then you just bring in your next piece, slide it in, cut it, next piece, slide it in. You only have to measure once. The members of our shop comprise a lot of different experience levels. Everybody from very, very experienced woodworkers to people who are just starting out on their journey through woodworking. So everybody is going to need help and can learn from each other. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. The shift supervisor's here. That's the person that's a good source of information and would be glad to help you in leading further on. And if you ever want to find out about how you can volunteer further in the, in the member shop, don't hesitate to ask the shift supervisor and we'll get you involved. There's a lot of different ways you can volunteer to help at the shop. And we need good volunteers.